Good evening, Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Martin Clark. I'm the director here at Bergen Constal. I just want to welcome everybody here tonight to this platform event, which we've organised to coincide with the opening of our exhibition, Robert Overby. The exhibition opened last night, and, uh, and we've organised this platform event to follow the opening of the show. Some of you who have come to these in the past will know that we used to do them immediately before the opening. But we decided we would try it this way around, to give everybody the chance to see the exhibition first with some of the other events. It was kind of weird having the conversation and then asking people to respond and, and, and give questions when they hadn't seen the show yet. I mean, it, it sort of built some anticipation, but um, I hope this is going to be a really productive conversation and there will be time for questions and for other people to make comments. And, uh, and so I hope you've all had an opportunity to see the exhibition. I want to start by first introducing our guests who join me here this evening. I'm delighted that we're joined by Alessandro Rabatini, who's the curator of the exhibition. Alessandro is a freelance curator, but also a curator with a number of institutional connections. But he's been working on this project for some two odd years. And actually, this is a touring exhibition. It was always organized as a collaboration between four institutions. So it opened in Geneva, at the CAC in Geneva, a number of months ago. It then went to the GAMEC in Bergamo. It's now with us, and it goes on to the consortium in Dijon immediately after this. And uh, it's been a, a long, long project, I think, that Alessandro has been involved with. And, uh, and it's great that he's here and he's able to talk to us about the exhibition this evening. I'm also delighted to introduce Alison Gingeras. Um, Alison is a curator and a writer based between New York and Poland. Um, she has contributed to the publication, which I'll say more about in a moment. But she just flew in late last night, so sadly wasn't here for the opening, but saw the show today, and we're really thrilled that she was able to come and join us. Um, we had a very um, productive and I think enlightening conversation that we, um, that we produced for the exhibition monograph. And Alison was, a, was a, a really key part of that. And so it's, it's great that we can um, have her here in the flesh, as it were, and, uh, and maybe kind of draw out some more of those responses now that she's seen the exhibition. I have two other quick things to say before we begin. The first is that another of the contributors to the monograph, Terry Myers, who was one of the people who organized some of the first exhibitions after Overby's death, um, Terry organized a big show at the Hammer Museum um, in LA in 2000, and also wrote a new essay for the monograph. Terry's gonna be here on the 2nd of October for another platform event in Landmark. So I hope that many of you will be able to join us again for that. And the last thing to mention very quickly is our new Sunday tours, which we start this season. So every Sunday now, there will be tours in the gallery at two o'clock, two o'clock. And so um, again, People are very welcome to come along and, and, and join those. So, the exhibition opened yesterday evening, and it's been a, it's been a big project that's been developed over the, a, a period of time. But in a way, parallel to that, an easily as ambitious and bigger project has been the production of this new monograph. When Alessandro first began talking about the exhibition, it was always with the idea that there was a need for a publication like this. And this isn't just an exhibition catalogue, it's much more comprehensive and inclusive, and it, goes, it represents the exhibition, but it goes a lot further, and it really does um, bring together uh, the most comprehensive um, reference monograph uh, on Overby in his life and his work. And we're thrilled that it was, yeah, it was back from the printers just in time for the opening, and so we're launching it here with the exhibition. But I wanted to mention it because, as I say, a component of that was a conversation that we began with Alison, again, a few months ago. Um, but maybe a good place to start, because I know, Alison, you saw the show today, yes. and it will be wonderful to be able to draw on that response, because I think for Alessandro and me, it's been something that we've been following around the world for a few months. Yes. But maybe it will be nice to start with Alessandro, and just to ask you to start at the beginning, really. You know, why Overby and why now? Well, I think that um, when I 
it was like my encounter with the work of Robert Overby was like a sort of a lucky chance because I um, I had the chance to see works uh, that were presented in two different fairs but in a very short period of time. Uh, two years ago, I remember that at Freeze Master within this section, which was curated by Adriano Pedrosa and it was about artists that um, like to be rediscovered. Um, Andrew Krebs Gallery, the gallery in New York, like was presenting this beautiful booth with a few um, architectural casts and the biggest one long wall from the Barclay House project, which is in the exhibition, was there. And I was really impressed by the um, by this presentation. And just like the week after at the FIAC in Paris, Cherry Martin the gallery from Los Angeles was also presenting a solo presentation, but with very different type of works, like smaller paintings, like uh, uh, little sculptures, maps. And I was really, I said, wow, like, I mean, this is extraordinary because all the works, they, had, they, they, they were of extremely good quality, but they were also so diverse mm -hmm. from each other. So I was really interested. I said, like, there, there must be something in here because, yeah. like, uh, the, the work is so diverse, but so, like, they're also good. And then I started researching a little bit. And I, I you know, when you have a really gut feeling, yeah. I have to do this show and I want to do it now yeah. because for me, it was really the work. I don't know, like, I, I'm still convinced that the work is really timely to present now, mm -hmm. to be presented now, because it's a work that shows an incredible freedom, mm -hmm. and the way that Robert Overby um, explored many different media, many different techniques, many different themes, is something that I think uh, younger artists today are more at easy with. Yeah. They're more like, a, it's something that belongs to us, this idea of, exploring without really like uh, being concerned to commit <coughs> to only one grammar. And then, and then there was, was also this uh, fantastic exploration of the materiality of the image, of, uh, and which is also something that I think it's really important now to explore because we have like much younger artists um, working with this idea of the dissemination of the visual information and bringing back from the digital nature of the image something which is actually very perceptual. Mm -hmm. And so it was like so much intrigued by the, but also by the, simply by the beauty of the works. I was really interested. And then I started approaching um, the institutions that, because I knew that I needed it was a, a big project with like all the loans coming from US and I needed like a more than one institution to commit to that. And in fact, actually Martin, I want to thank you because you were really one of the first to respond to this idea in a very sincere and immediate way. You immediately said, I want to do that. I also feel that is something that we have to do. Um, and I also think that I can, when we finally had all the institutions involved and all the contributors for the catalog, I realized that like what was connecting all these people, both the people involved in the making of the show and also the people involved in the, the book, I said like, wow, the, all these people that I've always like respected a lot of the work, they have something in common which is like a very independent vision upon mm -hmm. art. The work of Robert Overby is like a, it is a work about freedom. Mm -hmm. It is a work about being here in this moment and confronting reality. And I said, like, this is really what we have in common. Like, I mean, and so this is why I think that the the older presentation until now has been diverse but also consistent. Like the work it is. Like I think that the work it is very diverse, but also like really coherent. Uh, and this is also something that I wanted to explore. That's why what I tried to do in this show was like showing that actually he was making, he was exploring sculpture, but he was exploring painting and he was doing these two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope that the dialogue between the works shows yes. this. Well, that, just to jump in, yeah, if yeah. I may, um, and thank you again for the wonderful invitation. It's my first time coming to Norway, so I'm very pleased to come and see this excellent exhibition. 
And I was struck by, um, I first saw Overby's work in 2000 in Los Angeles at this exhibition at the Hammer Museum. And um, while I'm American and I lived in the States at the time, I was working at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and I had brought a colleague with my, me <coughs> to LA and we were doing studio visits with living artists and we went to see this show and um, that exhibition as far as I recall it, only really focused on the architectural cast and the sculptural aspect of the show. And in 2000, I, I was struck by the difference of the context of not only, you know, how the art world has changed, but intellectually and in terms of how um, both curators and the discourse have become more open to artist practices. So when I saw the exhibition in, in um, Los Angeles, I was with this French colleague and she was like, hmm, this is an artist who is pre, you know, anticipating an artist like uh, Rachel Whiteread, who was hot at that time and who was doing, you know, huge casts of buildings. And it was something that you couldn't quite, it was a curiosity to this artist who was extremely, you know, under the radar and, and such. But this exhibition is a radical departure in the fact that it really shows the simultaneity of his practice. That, you know, I, I love the way that you organize the show so that not only do you have a figurative painting hanging next to an architectural cast, but you really see, you can make, it's a, it's a very poetic and very layered, subtle, and precise argument in this exhibition. And, um, so fast forward to today, I think that why, one of the questions I think we were trying to deal with in the book and in, in general to maybe unpack further is to understand why today is this work so contemporary? And why can we, why was it back in 2000, but you know, not that long ago, you know, not to date ourselves, but you know, 15 years ago, it was um, only possible to receive his work via minimalism. Like, here's this, this artist who is a repressed minimalist, or is an artist who... And in fact, when you really examine the complexity of his work and the, and the plurality of his work, and the fact that he was on all different terrains that were, at the time, in the art world, ideologically opposed, you couldn't be making a figurative painting with charged sexual content at the same time that you were making a cast of a, you know, dilapidated home that looked like a minimalist work and that you, on top of it, you manipulated because we were discussing that, um, that it wasn't pure enough for the minimalist. Like, this is not Carl Andre. There's uh, other things happening. So I think today we are able somehow to um, connect and accept the, um, heterogeneity of his practice, and not only, something that was a liability 15 years ago today is all of a sudden his, one of the greatest, most compelling things about this body of work. So I want to throw it maybe back to you guys to, let's try and unpack, like, why, why well, is that? And I think, I think that's, that very point, it also refers to the other thing that I think it's important, and you have to say about Overby, is that you know he was so unknown because the work wasn't really shown at the time, and there are lots of reasons for that. And certainly one of the reasons is this reason that you alluded to, Alison, around just the problem that that diversity and multiplicity of kind of practice presented to the art world. I know in the conversation in the book, I was certainly reminded when we began talking about it of an artist like Paul Tech, who was somebody else who had you know he had some success for a moment in the mm -hmm. art world. Um, particularly around these kind of, uh, these meat sculptures, mm -hmm. kind of post-minimalist rubber meat sculptures that were in these kind of vitrines, these colored vitrines. But at the same time, he's making these kind of very sort of sentimental, seemingly quite kind of kitschy paintings. And for me, I was reminded of Overby and that problem, I mean, I think there was a problem of the diversity of the work. I think there was a problem that he was a graphic designer. And whilst we might think that's really cool now if you meet an artist and they're in a band and they're a designer and they're doing this and that and they're also making art, it sort of really does signal this, how far we've come in a Well, show. I mean, nowadays, gal you know, galleries jump to show Pharrell Williams to, exactly. you know, I mean, I think this is something that we have to contextualize as 
it would be like high treason to yeah, yeah, yeah. show yeah. in the and that sense that you know, of that time. He's, he's not an artist; he's a designer. Somehow. Yeah, and and then that coupled with the the problem that those works presented in and of themselves. It wasn't just the fact that he was doing lots of different things, but as you say, perhaps the most acceptable part of his practice and the bit that looks so much of its time in terms of his latex casts, he was then totally undermining in the terms of minimalism by, as you say, adding these kind of pigments, painting them, theatricalizing them. Mm -hmm. You know, they became um, much more prop-like. And, uh, and so I think there's a real... There's a real kind of, it's, it's, it's so much part of the reception of the work at that time, but it's so much part of the reason why now I think the work, as you say, looks so contemporary and so timely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that for me, for example, a very important aspect of the work, a theme that is there is uh, the idea of uh, what is original mm -hmm. uh, and what is talent. He was like one of the, the, the exhibition in Los Angeles was called Parallel because it comes from a quote of the artist himself who said, anybody can parallel me, which I think it's also like something very important that we should explore because uh, when we talk about the fact that, for example, he was applying uh, pigment on top of the architectural cast and by doing that he was sort of exaggerating the representational aspect at the expense of the indexical aspect. And then we look at the paintings where we have pastiche, we have uh, like this idea of quoting the old master's paintings. Uh, we also have this smaller series of uh, restoration paintings when he was not only working on appropriated paintings, but these paintings, it's important to underline the fact that he was buying them at the flea market, but they were cheap copies of old master's paintings. Mm -hmm. So they were like, uh, we, only, we already had so many l layers and of steps. Of bastardization yes. and of, you know, digestion. Exactly, almost. Yeah. exactly. So, so that this idea yeah. of how and where I can locate the origin of an image or the supposed originality of the artist's practice. And I, am, I think that this is also like important today because mm -hmm. I think that the artists are dealing with that idea of working in an over-polluted um, context of images, images like coming from all sorts of different like uh, uh, media and like uh, getting one on top of each other. And I think that like this idea that he was exploring, okay, I can take from, I can take from pop art, I can take from minimalism, I can take from, uh, um, in fact, like I think that one of the, the most intriguing um, perspective that we explored in the catalog is like through the text that Andrea Bellini, the director of the Center for Contemporary Art in Geneva, wrote about. He focused on the painting, but he focused on the fact that for him, like, uh, and I share this vision, Robert Ogilvy was really anticipating lots of issues that we deal a little bit later with postmodernism. Mm -hmm. The idea of, of course, the prestige, but also the idea of not committing to only just one style. Ultimately, the idea that style is not the side of truth. Mm -hmm. you know, and to me, like, this is also like a very um, important aspect of the work that I think, um, I wouldn't say that Robert Overby is an artist artist, but I had many conversations yes. with artists that they were deeply connecting. Maybe posthumously he became an artist artist. Yeah. I think like Paul Tech, because you mm. used that example, he was always an artist artist mm. it, while he was alive. Mm. But because Overby, you know, as far as I have understood, was so shunned and not, you know, given he, he didn't have a gallery, he was not really, he had this independent practice yeah. that he obviously pursued with great rigor, and it didn't matter that he wasn't showing. But um, I guess it, it makes me think too a lot about how I like the fact that he's like this, he is like an outsider, insider artist in the sense that he, he made, you know, this work not necessarily for consumption, not for exhibition, but it, he allowed himself to explore all these things that were of interest to him. And I, I felt like I really connected much more to, 
I was less concerned about his intentionality because, you know, because of the way the world has changed, both in terms of the art market, in terms of the art world, the opening up of, um, you know, art, ideological divides that used to separate, um, you know, you would never have three curators sitting up together who were, you know, <laughs> I'm a figurative painting curator and you are a conceptual art curator. No, I mean, today you can, you know, write about Robert Overby and Julian Schnabel. I'm speaking of my own <laughs> bibliography, for example. And, um, and Daniel Buren at the same time. It's all, all in the way everything is permitted. And it, that, that intentionality of his doesn't necessarily matter in terms of validating his work, but to me it strikes me as deeply genuine and deeply consequent because this diversity, while in the context of the 60s is surprising, or in the 70s and 80s, today it, it comes off as completely um, like this one man's passionate pursuit of these issues that were of concern to him, the patina, the skin, the fetish. And I, I, I like that, and I, it, maybe it doesn't even matter what the intentions were yeah, at I mean, the time, I mean, it because it resonates with us today. Yeah. And it comes back to what you said right at the beginning, you know, and I think Alexandra used the word freedom, and I hadn't really thought about that word. And it's not a word we've used a lot, I don't think, in the conversation, but that idea that the, the, the freedom that he wanted and that, that drove him in his practice was the thing that made his work so difficult. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, paradoxically, it was what that ostracization and he, he did achieve a kind of freedom because mm -hmm. suddenly he was free of that market and he was free of those galleries and, and he could, you know, it was, it was tough and it wasn't easy, but he had, I think, Again, that, the reason it resonates so strongly with artists is because the whole practice represents a kind of freedom around experimentation with materials, with themes, stylistically. And it was hard won, I guess, and, um, and I'm sure it wasn't deliberate. But, um, but I think that, that, that you know, the art world presents itself as this extraordinarily open, inclusive space. And to some extent that is true. And there are many practices and artists who found a home in the art world where you know they wouldn't find a home in many other worlds, whether it's filmmaking or writing or whatever. But at the same time, there's, we all know that there are some very, very strict, unwritten, but conservative rules around the way that you operate, the way that you behave, the way that you behave at dinners, the way that you behave at openings. And I think that, um, you know, there's some great anecdotes that I've heard. You know, Robert Overby, People weren't writing about his work, so he started writing about it in the third person. He would make these little promotional pamphlets, as far as I understand, which he would use to try and disseminate the work. And in fact, he, he began making paintings in the beginning when he'd been commissioned to purchase art for a corporation. And he decided that, so he bought a bunch of art, and then he thought, hang on, I could make some stuff that's as good as this. And he started making paintings, and of course it's not quite that trite, but all of these things were really difficult, I think. Some of them would still be difficult for the art world now, but I think, I think we shouldn't underestimate that difficulty, but how, like how precious that is, that there was somebody who was doing that and who had the kind of integrity and the commitment to just not try and play along, whatever the cost, I guess. But in fact, I think that we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget the fact that it, it is pretty clear that uh, in many phases of the work, he was actually looking at artists, like really serious artists, uh, and for these artists, like intentionality was uh, a big thing. Like, uh, you could say that he was looking at Duchamp, you can say that he was looking at Bruce Nam, and you can say that he was looking at Andy Warhol. But what is interesting is that <coughs> he had this idea of making like Baroque minimalism, meaning that like he was, he said, always said, I'm trying to uh, infuse uh, minimalism with some sort of humanity and I think that today this is also something really interesting because um, he managed actually to um, show some sort of intimacy that you can have with industrial materials or like materials like uh, concrete or vinyl mm -hmm. and it was also like showing that you can actually work with appropriated images from magazine either a fashion magazine or pornographic magazine and then like twist these images and make something that reveal actually 
um, yeah, a form of intimacy or a form of like beauty, a form of tenderness, or at least humanity again. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is also something that it's really, um, or at least maybe like in, during those years, um, people doing uh, this type of, not this type of work, but like they were showing a similar sensibility mm -hmm. for either women artists or homosexual artists. That they were trying to break certain rules by, as you said, like you said before, of course, uh, Paul Tech, mm -hmm. or uh, we can, of course, like quote Eva Hesse. Like, so, yeah, in the, reset, in, in the hit, we, we wrote a, like an art history that was based on the idea of a reaction. In fact, I think that the idea of reaction is important because it was actually like looking at these things, reacting at these things, and proposing like a third way to navigate certain practices. Which I think today, like, is well. I think there's almost a, um, you know, I hate the word, but a trend in the in the art world at the moment in the last few years of really scouring, going back and looking for these figures, whether they're repressed figures or they're figures who are on the margins because they come from, you know, countries that are not part of the, you know, circulation, the mainstream circulation of art. And um, over B, it, what's interesting is that with this show, I think it, it, it really, um, it's, you know, that I, re I just so remember that first wave of over B's introduction into the art world and legitimization. And now it's like, I mean, I'm thinking about, um, because we discussed in the um, interview about an artist named Betty Tompkins, who is, if you, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have any images, but, she is an artist who's still alive. She lives in New York, and she was a, a feminist painter who made these kind of grisaille, uh, close-up paintings of pornographic hardcore scenes, but where you don't, you know, you just see the body parts. It's like really the triple X action, and they're incredible paintings. And she had this practice, and her work was censored, and then she kind of kept making work and only very recently after 30 years people have rediscovered her and she's thank god she's still alive and she's able to kind of uh see uh this retro appreciation for her contribution and um over B, i think in this way it's uh, you know i guess i guess i brought this up because i think you were talking about the identity aspect of the work and I think that this is also a really one of the threads that makes it so interesting because um, this those collages in the show that use pornographic imagery and um, the paintings that have this obvious relationship to the subject matter of fetishism and that you know that type of constructive sexuality and even though you know heterosexuality, it's not necessarily normative heterosexuality, so it becomes, um, you know, what, it's tempting to want to um, reread or valorize him because there's this edge in the work, and it's easy to say, well, yeah, that's just yet another reason why Overby in his lifetime was not um, given proper recognition. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it was really problematic. I don't even know, like, a, I mean, <clears throat> how many people they actually saw either the cutout mm -hmm. uh, or the, the, the collages or anywhere like the most explicit works. Um, <clears throat> and of course, like, I mean, we can approach those paintings also, um, but just simply looking at the fact that he had access to these images and that like um, these images most probably they were speaking to him of um, some sort of exposure because like a, the, 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 with the architectural cast is the building that is exposed in its own skin that is stripped mm. bare, naked, and uh, images either coming from fashion magazines or from pornographic magazines, they speak about an exposure of the image, like the images that are basically uh, clearly constructed. Yeah, exploitation yes. is more than that. And so, like, for example, sex is not natural, but it's like, a, is, uh, is, is staged. Mm. The same way that it's staged, the, the effect of the burning mm -hmm. of the house onto mm -hmm. the... 
So we have this interest in, into the, the idea of like let's explore all the things like it's like the makeup. Yeah. What am I doing with this mask that conceal identity but that allows me to perform multiple identities? Mm -hmm. like, uh, we have the subject of the role playing in the in in the works, and we have the this idea of the makeup that turn the, um, the which is an overall makeup that that, that turns like the face into a mask. Mm -hmm. uh, so like the the faces they even become bidimensional. Yeah. We have paintings where the faces are like they like a. Um, and so it goes back to the collage, for example, the fact that the collage is so present into the painting. So I think that what is interesting, what is interesting, is if we detect, if we like not focus exactly on the as you call it, like um, Betty Tompkins, which is like um, the cropping mm -hmm. uh, is really important in yeah, those paintings. The scale, the, the scale cropping. and the cropping, yeah. cropping, which is also something that uh, cropping and in fact like I mean, it's it's coming a similar from a strategy, yeah, exactly. it's coming. Uh, and cropping, and cropping, I mean, of course, like I mean, reveals the the fact that these images like uh, are not like uh, true, but like I mean, they have been staged by somebody. Well, I think it's about, and we were discussing earlier today that it's about some kind of. That's the political rub that's in the work because it is about a kind of empowerment. Like, if you were looking at these things, in the, I would imagine at that time, you know, at the height of second wave American feminism, you would be like chased out of town, you know, and called all kinds of names, misogynist, and all of this. But today, I think because of the complexity and the difference of um, how mainstream politics and those terms have changed. These works, to me, speak about a kind of empowerment, a recognition of how, um, you know, by taking out all of the male contributions of the pornography and just having this kind of femaleness, I think it, it to me, it almost evo was evocative of um, kind of non-Western cultures using the vaginal imagery as a symbol of matriarchal power, like the power of women, and I, I think that it's not coming out of objectification. It is coming from a different place. And um, I think that today we can open the archive and look at these things inflected with the spirit of our time and you know, really give him this credit for going there bravely at that time. I Again, going back to freedom. I think that's interesting, but I think they also do something quite important within the exhibition in terms of its curation and the works that, that have been brought together. Because I think both of you have said already that I think all of the works really have an incredibly strong relationship to the body and to, to skin. And, um, and to this idea of fetish and these ideas of the kind of exposure and concealment. And we could maybe talk a little bit more about some of those things. And I think in so many of the works, there's, you can read, we can read those things into them. And I think one of the really beautiful things, which again, you mentioned, Alison, in the way this exhibition has been curated, is it's one of the first times that the kind of simultaneity has been brought together. And it really does, it means that despite the kind of stylistic and material kind of diversity, you can see really consistent, you know, a few very consistent, strong themes and a kind of real depth to the practice. And I think all of the kind of politics around those collages, they also, for me, they, they, they give a very direct eroticization of the show. And I think that's something that's there in all of the works and is alluded to, and maybe, yeah. I, I think it was a risk in some ways to show those collages, and they've never been shown before. But I think that what they do do is that they, they, they take on the fact that this was a very personal practice, and that you, you can't talk about any of that work and not take that incredible kind of um, relationship that Overby obviously had with those images and materials and processes. You know, it's, a, it's, it's very personal as well. And I think somehow they add that kind of... They, they, they somehow re-inject that into the show. Um, and I think that idea of kind of exposure and of um, the surface and skin and 
and, and kind of loss and decay. I mean, we've talked a lot about this, and you know, many of those works, the, the latex pieces most obviously, you know, they're changing all the time. And if you look in the catalogue at the installation shots when they were first made, you know, the piece with the windows, for instance, is kind of flat against the wall. You know, every time that's shown, it sags a bit more, the colours are changing, they're deteriorating. So they have this kind of obsolescence and decay and loss built into them. And I, 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 in, in the catalogue, again, I, I kind of mentioned this kind of reference to something like the kind of relic, the religious relic, and I, I sort of posited that it was a very Catholic sensibility within the practice. Mm -hmm. And I've since discovered actually from Linda that Overby wasn't brought up a Catholic. So he didn't have that history like a number of other artists at that time, like Robert Smithson, for instance, or Paul Tech, very obviously. Mm -hmm. But it still seems to be this kind of investment in um, the, the object, and, and this comes through fetishism as well, you know, the, the mm -hmm. surrogate object somehow holding, and, and somehow holding some kind of substance and some kind of spirit. And, uh, yeah, this conversation is reminding the, this kind of that painting of the monk that's a, mm. you know, an appropriation of an old master. I think it, it reminds, I read this book called Pictures and Tears, mm. a history of people who have cried in front of paintings. And it's interesting because I think it doesn't matter um, whether or not, like if you make an analogy to film or theater, whether we're watching actors who are acting out a tragedy or you know you have a compelling you know film and you weep you know does it matter that it's fake you know it doesn't matter that that's a fake it, it's really the how the artist reinvests it and turns it into a devotional object and i mean i, I that's kind of one of my own personal yeah, yeah, obsessions yeah. as a catholic a uh, former Catholic um, and someone who's really interested in, um, you know, Flemish art history and such. But I think that th this is also why, again, to go back to this kind of thread that has run through our conversation, why I think it is so compelling because we live in an age now where everything is fake, everything is staged, you know, everything is Instagrammable and and such. But you get struck. It doesn't matter that there are these, some of these patinas on the works are, um, you know, doctored, they're not the actual in indexical imprint of a house in 1973. What matters is how they touch us now, how they make us feel, and I think that there's a certain, uh, the way we deal with culture today, and we deal with those questions of authenticity, it's more about their emotional impact or their intellectual impact than, you know, whether or not, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. But in fact, I think that one thing that is interesting when we speak about these things is like to, to go back to the idea, of course, we, when we speak about the practice, we can speak about appropriation, no? of course, like, I mean, it was referring to images. And the history of appropriation actually touches, like starting from Duchamp until like, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, Richard Prince, like it touches things like um, a sort of a distance, a sort of an irony, a sort of detachment. You can appropriate things and images in order to critique them or in order to like uh, play with the idea of ordership and all the things mm -hmm. that we know. Yeah, the turn them all, <coughs> situationism yeah. and all of these things. That While when a comment that I've heard from people visiting the show is that, oh my God, this show is moving. And like uh, yesterday, like Martin used the word moving uh, for the opening speech to call it like uh, to show. And, I, and I, I've been asking myself why it, I find it also moving, why it is that. And I think that actually it has to do with the fact that he was, true, he was appropriating images, but he was not distancing himself from those images. He was actually, uh, absorbing them, uh, accepting them, and I think ultimately loving them. Because, for example, uh, in Bergamo we had these quotes from the artist at the entrance of each room, and I choose this, uh, this quote to, for the late paintings, for the most confrontational ones. Uh, when he was talking about like uh, the images of sex, and he said like, uh, you know, like ultimately this is what the human beings are, and you cannot, yeah. you know, you cannot, what do you do? Like you don't, you you you, you distance yourself from mm -hmm. uh, from this. Like uh, it was a, that quote was referring to the fact that he's saying like I love 
the purity of abstract art, but I cannot do abstract art all my life. You know, I have to get my hands dirty with something else, which is, mm -hmm. and this I think it's most probably one some, something that is interesting today. This idea of okay, quoting and appropriating without really turning um, th the practice of appropriation into like so, some sort of distance or so, some sort of irony or uh, not even critique, you know, but accepting it and living with it. Um, so I also think that this is like something that defines. Yeah, I think that artists often fall into like the hot or cold camp, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think that um, he's definitely in the hot camp in yeah. terms of that, um, you know, emotion that there's that, and I guess that ha goes back to he was allowed, to, he had permission to do that because maybe the fact that he didn't have uh, exhibitions and a diary, you know, he was true to himself working in his studio and making this work. You know, I, I think that, that that kind of permission is rare. Mm, definitely. I don't know if, like, if somebody from the audience has some comments or questions, because I would really like to hear... Uh... Yeah. Oh, thank you. Could you just yes. wait for the mic as we're recording? Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, I would just like to kind of probe a little further what you were saying, Alison, about what does it matter about intention if the representation draws tears, essentially. Um, and to think about, you know, posthumous uh, curation mm -hmm. um, and talk about kind of the plus, but this is for, for all three, the pluses and minuses, the difficulties and the sort of uh, benefits of working with a dead artist because of the ability to kind of contextualize the work and then also have, have the ability as a curator to, to kind of create a context that may or may not be there, but also to try and be essentially true to intention of the artist. Yeah. Well, I think that, um, I mean, to answer your question, I, um, we were speaking, like, the last few days during the installation, we uh, had this courier coming from uh, one of the lenders, one collection, and he was speaking about the conservation issues of the work, uh, which are actually really there, especially for the, um, uh, for the architectural cast. Um, and of course, I mean, his job is to preserve these works, but the work also resists uh, that conservation, like uh, it shows this, like for example, if you see the wall with the two windows, the image that we published on on the book, like uh, it shows that it was taken from Robert himself at the time that he made the piece. The lines are really straight; the piece is there. While now, like it shows the gravity, it shows like the decay of. Uh, and I was like thinking, you know, like what really you can you can do as much as you can to preserve the piece, but the piece actually resists that and, uh, and asserts the fact that one of the dimension of the piece itself is the passing of time. And I think that you can, as a curator, you can um, score your exhibition as much as you can, but if something that you decided to show is not in the work, the work will just flip it up, like, you know, like it will just, it will not be successful. You cannot really force the reading of something when if that piece has not some of the quality mm -hmm. that you want to show there. You can, of course, like, I mean, decide to underline set of certain aspects. For me, like, uh, my take on the work was, um, again, of this, like, uh, brutality and tenderness at the same time, so I hope that I managed to show that. But I don't think that you can really, like, try and turn into something else which is not there, because the work it, the whole thing would not be convincing. The whole thing would just look, you know, fake, speaking of like. Yeah. <laughs> and I think uh, there's, a, there's a kind of interesting wider question as well about responsibility and where the responsibility lies. And I think it's interesting because I've made many exhibitions with living artists and I've made a few exhibitions with artists who are dead. And what I always remind myself is that the responsibility of the curator is always to the work. 
And that's really, that can be really difficult when you're working with a living artist, actually. And it's difficult, you know, an artist has a relationship to their work as the maker of that work, but then the work goes off and it might get bought or it might go into a museum or a collection or it might stay in their studio. But as a curator, I think, one way of looking at the position of the curator is it's this kind of other. It's the other person who's not the artist who's going to bother to have a relationship with this, maybe the next relationship, or to look at it. And so it's not the maker, it's the, it's the other person. And I think if you think in those terms and you think about that responsibility to work, then actually, you know, I mean, I, uh, OB was making that work, and now it's there and now it's on its own, and actually everything moves on around it. And the test, I think, of really compelling work. But it's also about that thing that we've been talking about. Sometimes it has to wait a bit of time, or sometimes stuff has to shift around it for you to really be able to see it. But I think if you think about that, the, the, the relationship is with the work rather than the artist, or even the artist's intention. Because I also think that, I know a bunch of artists who make really fantastic work, but I don't think they know quite why it's fantastic in the way that I think it is. And no one's right or wrong, but it's... Well, know. it's like an intentionality also over the centuries gets lost. Mm. You know, I mean, when you go to the Met, and, you know, sorry to be so New York-centric, but you go to the Met and you look at a Jan van Eyck painting, you know, the iconographic meaning of that painting is often also lost, even though each, every single uh, detail in that painting had a specific meaning and almost to the point where there could be a, um, a dictionary entry for each thing. So intentionality is something that is important and I don't think curators should be cavalier about it, whether the artist's alive or dead, but I also think that, you know, a living artist that I know well said to me, I think a measure of success of my work is often when the intentionality gets twisted and there's a great misunderstanding. You know, when, when a work is able to generate something that means it becomes appropriated in a completely different context and, and, and has another life or takes on a political significance or takes on a personal significance. I mean, I guess that's where the anecdote about um, pictures and tears comes in. Um, where it's not just about, you know, a kind of academic critical meaning or some kind of, you know, idealized intentionality that has to be preserved forever. I think that that's, that's why we're so interested in preserving cultural objects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I think. I mean... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and as an artist, when you're making stuff, you're always making the next thing, or, or most often you are. And it's, yeah, you can do a project like this kind of exhibition with a living artist or, or a deceased artist, but essentially it's a different way of looking when you gather a lot of stuff together and you put it all together and then you say, okay, you know, like even 20 years is a long time if you live through it. But if you put, you know, 20 years worth of work in one room, it, it, something happens that wasn't happening in that same kind of... Uh, temporality somehow. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's really exciting about doing a show like this, that the temporality gets changed and, and then, you know, I can look at those incredible stitched canvas maps, as OVB called them, of the latex works which were made earlier and think about the unbelievable sort of fetishistic, again, for me, materiality of, you know, stitching those things. That's kind of a really, that was, they're weird, those works, and they're amazing. And then, and then the monk restoration painting, where he's kind of cleaning, obsessively cleaning the dirt off in these little patches. Again, that thing of revealing and concealing. And uh, suddenly, this kind of, yeah, all of this stuff kind of emerges in a mm. really kind of exciting and, uh, yeah, well, it just does. Did you want to say anything, Alison, about first part of what David was talking about. Well, maybe we've answered it. Did we scratch it? Did we get it? The picture? Intentionality, I guess. Well, I think we no, probably covered it. I guess, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess the only thing would be, you know, the ability, you know, not having them in the room. It, is it helpful to not sort of have the artist there? Is there actually a Some benefit? Some curators love that. <laughs> I have colleagues who would specialize in that. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know. I guess it's really, yeah, it's helpful to have the artists there, um, especially, you know. Alison, it yeah. depends who it is. That's the honest answer. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. 
I like the difficult ones. Yeah. <laughs> Are there but any I mean, like, uh, it, I think that this is like something that you can always do because if you, like for example, if you're a teacher um, and you produce certain discourses about certain artist practices, uh, you produce knowledge and you influence the vision of people and of course, like, I mean, the people, they can disagree, like the artist himself can disagree or mm. other experts, they disagree, but then like uh, that thing, it stays, you can write, like writing, for example, is not that different because in the case that you're writing for, for example, for a monograph, you can actually have a conversation with the artist, but certain, like uh, when you do criticism, you don't, you don't speak with it, you don't make sure that the artist is agreeing with you, but you still produce a vision upon the work so there are so many things that actually like uh, they are not based on the fact of producing a knowledge about the work which is based on cer certain parameters that you can share with the artist himself that are part of what we call our field. And uh, even, even buying art is a form of producing knowledge. You know, like, uh, when the museum put up the display of the collection and create connect connections between the work, I guess that many of the artists, they disagree about like the relationship that you establish, sure. the, the, the type of narrative that you produce, but they don't own the work anymore, and they cannot really do that much to, uh, you know, to resist that, that interpretation. That's why, I mean, maybe I'm optimistic, but I think that when the work is really strong and really good, at least like it keeps performing um, meanings over time, mm. and that's why, like for me, it is important, like always to. I always try to focus on really problematic practices because to me, like this is what defines art. Like something sure. that you cannot never say, okay, I got it, and it will continue to release a power over time. And mm. but really, honestly, I think that you can do so many things apart from curating a show, which can. Mm create another form of knowledge about the work that is not really mm -hmm. um, only about curating, to sitting next to the artist and making sure that you're doing what... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course then, you, you know, like, uh, you base your work on certain things. For example, the first room that tries to um, show the fact that he was looking at surrealism, I don't think that it's something that is not there because it's in the note, it's in the early works, it's in like... Uh, so we can discuss how much he was interested in, in surrealism, but we cannot deny the fact that surrealism mm. is, is there. And it doesn't come up by just making a little bit of interior decoration with the works. It comes with, uh, with um, studying the work. Are there any other questions or comments? Wonderful talk, first of all. Um, so my question has to do with the idea of artists problematizing their own practice. And I think Overby was a genius at that. The Red Book being an artwork and a problematization of his own practice in the fact that he produced unedited, good, bad, and ugly, everything he did for four years. <laughs> so his idea about that was actually to um, complicate the read on the work that an artist, in, and also undo the way artists would create their own history, their own read, you know, the way the world might read their work, that by actually publishing everything that one would do in the private climate of their own studio, you know, those bad things, those weird things, those other kinds of things, that that's the way he actually saw his own work. Um, and I think several of the ways you've talked about the work today actually address that. Um, it's something, I don't know whether you feel this um, with artists today, I think it's being undone in a bit, but whether people are afraid to show, you know, they can only show this certain face to the world, you know, and as curators, um, how do you work your way 
I guess, around that, you know, that kind of idea, because this is certainly, Alessandro, I remember when you were picking the work, the fact you picked the collages, I went, really? <laughs> you know, because they always seem to be, you know, and, and, and it's the way Bob would want his work presented, you know, in that kind of way. You know, this is the humanity. The one thing he was interested in across the board was humanity, whether it was sexual, you know, architectural, you know, it's what he worked against in minimalism. So I guess that's a question in a way. Mm. I should probably just clarify and then I'm going to pass over to Alessandro, but the, the red, red book that you're, you're referring, referring to, Linda, was a, it was a publication that he made over four, well, it documented four years worth of work. And as Linda said, every single work was dated, not just like the month and the year, but literally the day that it was made. And the book's been reprinted recently, and so we have some copies which are available. But it's a kind of beautiful and, uh, I was going to say fascinating, but it's not, that's the wrong word. It's a kind of amazing publication. Um, well, it's a great conceptual gesture, I think. Exactly. Yeah, because, for example, the, what, what is interesting about the Red Book is that, for example, he didn't make justice of many pieces. For example, he was playing a lot with the scale, and certain images are like like uh, really really small. You cannot mm -hmm. even because the see. book's format is like those. the book itself is really yeah. small, and then you have like uh, images that you can have an idea what you're looking at, but the others are like uh, they're really really small, and there is no yeah there is no apparent reason mm -hmm. why I should diminish the, the 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 understanding of a piece. Or for example, it was including destroyed pieces. Mm -hmm which is also something which is like in the context of, so like uh, you may have the feeling that the book was, had to perform the function of providing some knowledge about the work, but he was also including what he deliberately decided to destroy. And then he was also including uh, things that are not immediately recognizable as finished works, mm -hmm. which like sort of exposing the process, for example. Or like, so all these things, they, uh, they're part of what you mentioned about problematizing the, the um, we all have difficulties with this word, problematizing the, the, the reception of the work and posing it as something that I guess uh, should be articulated over and over and over mm -hmm. because otherwise you would have done like a more polished, refined publication. Yeah, it's and not the me like the kind of hyper controlled marketing mise en scène that dominates a lot of, you know, let's say blue chip art that today, but then when you mention other artists, I think what's interesting is that you know, I can think of one or two examples of young artists who use the internet to like dump everything they make. So it's almost like a red book online of, um, you know, archive of just, and, and you know, that kind of act of exposure, I think has a lot of affinity to Overby's position of like demystifying, you know, there's, you know, there are those artists who the studio is the place of alchemy and secrecy and, um, self-mythologizing, and then there is another approach, I mean, there's many other approaches, but this other approach, I think, is some, a little bit of a thread that I've seen in some younger artists' work, and especially the way they use, um, you know, internet publishing or social media. Which brings back to the idea of intentionality, because... Yes. Because, like, uh, he was, at the time, he was very active and even very successful as graphic designer. So, and he was... I mean, on a daily basis, working with the idea of editing. Yeah. So why he deliberately decided... And visual identity. Yes, yeah. Not to embrace editing, but just like uh, doing, okay, this is, this is everything that I did in four years. But I think, you know, and, and I've always read it either, as you said right off, Alison, a great conceptual gesture. You know, yeah. you can read that within a history of kind of... Uh, like 60s conceptualism, where you would just do that, that would be the project. I would document everything, I would date it. Da, da, da. But I think you could also, the other way that I've thought about it and read it is in terms of, you know, what, uh, maybe it comes back to that freedom thing again. You know, what was, so, what was so enticing to him about that space of the studio and, and art making? You know, he's a guy who is a successful graphic designer. And, and what that book also talks to me about is, is that the process 
is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. That it's that that it's the doing. It's that you keep going into the studio every day and you make something else, you make something else, you make something else, and then at the end of four years, okay, that's what I did, let me have a look at it. So maybe it's a really personal thing as well. And then I can see what I've done. But that's, for me, it feels like that red book sums up that, 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 that kind of relationship he had to his work. He wasn't trying to, you know, he wasn't trying to make one big finished thing. He was just, it was about process and it was about the space that was created, that, or that he created for himself. But in fact, I think that it embodies like many really important things. The fact that you mentioned, for example, many times the date of the work is the precise day when he executed it, which I think it's a way to say, I was there that day. And it's not about like, a, you know, writing a diary. I think it's about like really speaking about time in as like something. a day painting, like an yes. encore kind as of something thing. Something that is real, time is real. You know, yeah. like a, what you are today is not what you are tomorrow. That's why, like, for example, Martin Herbert, when he wrote about the show in, uh, in, uh, in, in Freeze, so like, I think that the work is about the fact that things are, they don't last forever. And I think that you have that important information about time, you have that acceptance and inclusion of the mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that it really, like, a, it's a big, as you say, like a conceptual work, because, and for a person that had to do with editing and image yeah. and identity, branding. I mean, he was working with brands, yeah. so, which was about like uh, to make the best of what you do. Yeah. And like, uh, so these are like things that are really important. Well, it's almost like that humility is, was his brand, you know, mm -hmm. because it was this not exposure of his practice. And it reminds me of, um, Charlie Ray's piece, All My Clothes, you, you know, yeah. where he, which is probably contemporaneous, or maybe Charlie's piece is a little bit later in the late 70s. Um, but that impulse of, you know, I'm human, this is my practice, and I'm going to frame it as such. You know, it's not just the fact that, it, you know, everyone is human, but uh, to put it in a book and to, you know, deliberately design it in the way you described and, and such. Yeah. Are there any more comments or questions? Oops, sign up. Um, another question maybe around the, the uh, um, aspect of intention, intentionality again. Um, I'm wondering if um, the exhibition um, where we are faced with this incredible body of work, and maybe uh, especially in this exhibition that brings to together all of these um, different aspects of the works that were happening simultaneously. Um, and the fact that it speaks to us, as you have been talking about, um, um, feels so contemporary and, uh, and all of this. I'm just wondering if the question of why the question of intentionality keeps coming up, um, do you think the reason why that feels um, so pressing is because it uh, it is not really um, a re-reading of a practice, but um, uh, a discovering now, um, yeah. uh, all these years after. Like, um, what happened if he, uh, in uh, while he was work making the work, had entered a, a kind of critical discourse that um, that there was sort of a one reading at that time of what he was doing that we could like rediscover today. Um, but and so I, I think my question is uh, how much uh, of a contempor or uh, a critical reading was there at the time of his work? Did he ever like enter? Was he seen like the concept of Baroque minimalist, for example? Was it discussed in relation to the minimalists in the 70s? And well. I mean, there are like a few good um, comments upon his work. Um, um, for example, I mean, one of the most interesting is like uh, of a show that he made when he was alive, and it was like, uh, and the, the the art critic who reviewed the show, he was, uh, uh, he was writing that he his work was like a, a really good, fresh contribution to the to the practice of printmaking. 
So the, there was like there were people that of course read the work and um, and, um, and discussed it quite appropriately. Um, but of course, I mean, like it's the thing is that they were like very few. So like um, uh, it's not like a, there was not a huge. This is like when you go through the book and you see the chronology is really evident because the literature during his lifetime is really, really little and then it gets bigger uh, around like 2000 and bigger and bigger and also like the list of exhibitions and that. So yes, I mean, it's, but it is of course, I mean, the fact that he's like, uh, it's not, a, it, it's a discovery now, it's part of the way that we react to the show, of course, I mean, it's there, then we cannot ignore it. Like, we cannot ignore that the fact that it's, it's, it looks fresh to us also because we didn't know about it. And so, like, uh, it's, uh, we would be, we would just say, like, uh, something which is not true if we would ignore that. Um, I think we may have time for one more question or comment if anybody has one. No? But we've talked for over an hour, and so I'm going to wrap it up, but I just want to thank Alessandro and Alison, and all of you for coming and listening and, and for your contributions. Um, the exhibition runs for eight weeks, I think, so there's plenty of time to, um, to come and spend time in the show, and I hope that many of you will come back. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.